the Battle of uh, Bråvelir. Probably, at least in the sagas, the most uh, famous battle of the late Iron Age going into the Viking Age. And uh, although traditionally you can't, people don't count the Viking Age as having started just yet, but in this period you, you start having uh, a lot of actions along the Frisian coast and into Frankish areas out of Denmark, most notably with uh, uh, Gudröð or Götrik or uh, Gottfred <coughs> and uh, his uh, uh, actions against Charlemagne and his empire. Anyway, the Battle of Bråveller is uh, prominent in uh, the saga literature and it's also it was a, according to the sagas uh, it was a battle that where I mean the character the gallery of uh, kings and great warriors was just uh, very uh, overwhelming and it's uh, also one of the few major battles where um, all of the nobility of Scandinavia crashed together. All, uh, uh, it was a battle between um, Harald Wartooth of Denmark, who at that time was old of age, and uh, the famous uh, Sigurring out of Sweden. And both of these had uh, allies in Norway, so you had practically all the nobility of Norway coming down and taking part as well. And, um, Siguring is also famous for being, uh, well, he's famous in his own right in saga literature. Uh, he was a great king and uh, held sway over all of, uh, well, most of Sweden, probably all of Sweden at the time, modern Sweden and uh, large, large tracts of Norway and uh, Denmark as well. At least uh, Shellan and the islands there for some time. And he's the father of Ragnar Lodbrok, uh, who also achieved great fame. So, uh, so even though he's most known for he was a Swedish king, of course. You can even see in place names on the eastern part of Norway. Ringrike, Ringsaker, a place like this, Ringebu, that uh, quite likely have a connection to uh, his overlordship. So the Battle of Bråvele in, uh, is mainly, there are two uh, sources. There's a saga fragment. Uh, which uh, focuses on uh, the battle and there is this uh, Gesta Danorum by uh, Saxo Grammaticus, the Danish uh, middle, medieval historian who also has a lengthy description. Today I'm going to be reading the, um, the saga fragment because it's so colorful, it's so it's such a marvelous piece of saga literature and a really good read while uh, uh, and uh, focuses uh, for a large part on the battle itself and the events there while uh, Saxos is more about the political layout of the time and also the build-up more than uh, the, the battle itself although he also covers it ex extensively he covers all the stuff around as well quite extensively which perhaps the saga did, but we only have uh, chunks of it. According to uh, uh, Snorre, there were innumerable um, soldiers on either side, 
also according to the sagas, although Snorri, he, he, he mentions in quite immense numbers like Sigurings fleet, when it was all gathered, it was 2,500 ships. And uh, that uh, the numbers of the fallen, only of the nobles, was um, uh, 12,000 nobles on the Sigurings side and 30,000 nobles on Harald uh, Wartooth's side which also is a very high number and it's even said in the sagas that that number isn't counting um, um, the, the, uh, the, the private soldiers. <clears throat> These numbers are very large. Um, but I, I see some people cutting it down like to 5 and 10 percent if they even acknowledge that the battle existed and this is that's uh, there's that's also speculation so uh we know from uh, historical sources that when the even if there was only one king going out even a petty king could uh, amass and uh, you know uh, quite a substantial fleet of boats so if you have all the great kings of Norway and Sweden and Denmark crashing together with uh, auxiliary soldiers from Sa Saxony and from uh, the P northern Polish areas, the Vend areas, and from the Baltic kingdoms. Also the Russian principalities are joining in. Then uh, <clears throat> we're, not, we're not only talking a few boats, a couple of dozen, and then I think it's... Uh, quite likely that uh, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of uh, ships. The Norwegian content, the, the saga fragment of the Norse sagas, the Icelandic saga, is more uh, conservative than um, uh, than uh, Saxo with the numbers. And he mentions that when the whole Norwegian fleet came down out of Vik to join the armies, it had 250 ships, which uh, probably also could be considered a, an exaggeration but not so big because uh, when we read through the names of all the different uh, petty kingdoms that are joining the fight it's basically every single area and kingdom and fylke of Norway uh, is joining in on either Sigurding the Swedish side or uh, Harald Wartooth the Danish side and Harald Wartooth at that time he uh, held sway over, uh, quite likely, over the Vend areas in, along the coast of the south coast of the Baltic Sea, um, either directly or through uh, gel, uh, uh, guild money, and the same for the, uh, some of the um, Baltic uh, kingdoms. And he brings in thousands of auxiliaries from there, and some of his shield maiden captains also from uh, these areas. Also, he brings in thousands of auxiliaries from Saxony. And Saxony at that time was really caught between a rock and a hard place. Because uh, you had the Franks from the south pushing in, waging war against them continually. And they would, they would uh, be, uh, come under their kingship eventually. And from the north, you had the Danish kings punishing them along the coast continuously and, uh, and demanding uh, ransom. Uh, well, not only that, there was also uh, among the uh, royalty of the, the Saxon royalty and the Danish royalty, there were very close connections. The background for the war the battle itself is a little bit obscure. Well, it's not obscure, but it's perhaps hard to understand from a modern uh, mindset. At least the explanations were given. The one that is most mentioned is that uh, Harald Wartooth was getting old of age and um, was uh, people his, his um, earls and his men weren't too happy about it. And so he 
to avoid the shame of dying uh, in the sotadul or in the, the illness death, he invited Sigurin to hold a grand battle. That's basically that's the main explanation. That's the explanation given in the saga fragment. It's also one of the two explanations given in Gesta Danorum. And he, he makes it quite sure that um, when we follow this story, that uh, none of the armies should be, at least his army should not be larger than the Swedish and preferably smaller because he, he uh, according to Saxo, had an eye to the, he wanted that uh, Sigurin would defeat him so he could die an honorable death. And uh, then he invited all the kings, great warriors to join him in a magnificent battle where they could join him to Odin or go out as a champion. The other explanation which is only mentioned in uh, Gesta Danorum is um, that uh, he and Sigurin who were Mog they were connected by a marriage, <clears throat> so relatives in a sense, um, uh, and uh, actually had, had on good terms. But uh, that uh, their messenger, who sent messages between them, a certain Brune, he died while on a mission, and Odin took his appearance and sent messages between them in such a way that they would start hating each other. And that this hate built up in the Harald Wartooth, so he finally was uh, engulfed in rage and wanted to, and wanted to um, go to war with uh, Sigurin. <clears throat> but um, so there are no motives given that they wanted to actually, you know. Uh, no material motives given. And the one mentioned in both is actually that Harald Wartooth kind of like wanted to invite all the champions of the North to a magnificent battle. And um, that's what it became. Of course, this is uh, probably in the 700s. Um, some of the characters uh, mentioned, uh, you know, you can place them if you compare with Inglinga Saga, they're at the same time as uh, Olaf Tretelja and Halfdan Kvitbein are making moves in uh, into Norway, which could make sense actually because uh, the kings of eastern kings of Toten and uh, Hedmark and uh, Opland and all these kings, uh, if they were in such a magnificent battle and lost many men, it would be a very nice opportunity for um, the uh, exiled Ynglingas to uh, establish themselves in a weakened area of Norway. Because all the, actually all the areas that he went in, Halfdan Kvitbein and conquered, their nobility were in the Battle of Broveli. So that would be Hadland, Toten, uh, Upland, Alf and uh, Hedmark, all those areas. Their kings and champions were at Broveli. <coughs> but that's just speculation. Um, and of course the people argue against the heuristicity of the story. Um, since the actual place of the battle hasn't been uh, identified, uh, some suggest uh, Bråviken in, in Sweden and other places are suggested as well. Mostly in Sweden, well all in Sweden. Then um, there are people, then it's uh, uh, hard to use the argument that you can't find um, uh, any uh, like massive amounts of uh, weapons or weapon finds connected to it. Um, 
Also, if you use that argument to dispel it completely, then there are a lot of Roman battles that wouldn't have happened because there are many Roman battles where the people have a hard time finding uh, large amounts of weaponry and, and such. I, I haven't seen like very heavy, strong, good arguments against the, heroes, the history of it. Uh, some argue that since uh, Hugh Gleick, when he, when he fought uh, King Hake, which in Yngling saga is placed to Furis Volna, seems to be the battle of uh, Frisia where Hugh Gleick, a Danish king, about the same time uh, was uh, killed. Uh, so the, there's obviously, or could be a g likely, that uh, uh, Snorre has uh, misplaced Frisia with Fyris in Sweden. That uh, this argues again could be, you know, another mistake. But in that instance, the battle actually happened, uh, even if it was in a different place. So Bråvele. Uh, I think, especially since it's so important in saga literature and saga poems, and all the <clears throat> heroes within are like some of the main, main, main uh, kings of legendary kings of the Norse pantheon, and I think it's hard to argue against it. Then you can, of course, discuss the scale and discuss the placement and discuss the, yeah whatever what happened there i think there's they're not really unless you say they're all it's <clears throat> every mention of it is a lie or it's just built upon one big lie and been repeated i mean it could be but they live closer to their times than we do so i tend to give them a little bit of trust Anyway, I'm going to read the fragment of uh, the saga. Very lively description. A little bit of commentary and um, and uh, uh, hope you enjoy it. J actually, just before I read it, just a couple of things that are also interesting with this saga is um, uh, the shield maidens feature very prominent here which I think is uh, fascinating and tells a lot about the sentiment of uh, Norse society and uh, the, the relationship between uh, uh, men and women <coughs> or northern Germanic society because actually uh, one of the shield maidens she's not a she's not Norse she's a Slav and um, from a Slavic country and they they are you know, hold their own i mean they they're just as uh, ferocious powerful and great warriors as the men in the in the battle and are described as such in the saga there's no difference there and then <clears throat> regarding the scale of the battle this is a time that is very close to the Vendel area in era in Sweden where you have the most magnificent finds and they're mirrored by the Sutton Hoo find in England and you have uh, like one of the absolutely most rich epochs of Swedish mo uh, history the later Viking Age finds can't really compare to the Vendel Age finds in its richness and uh, artistry and, and such. Vendel era is only era in my opinion that can really compare is the first Bronze Age area in the north which of course shows strong influence from uh, Greek Celtic uh, areas and of course probably quite a lot of it was, was of Celtic and Greek manufacture. <clears throat> But um, yeah, so this is the kings in this area, era of Sweden and Denmark uh, were kings that had uh, relationships with the Gothic 
kingdoms or their predecessors had relationship with the Gothic kings further south. They shared a cultural heritage and also ancestral heritage. So even if they're, they don't have the written sources that uh, came later with the Icelandic sagas, I think it's, uh, uh, you can quite safely say that they weren't less um, powerful and rich than the later Viking Age uh, era, especially so for Sweden. Uh, I think in many ways this was a more magnificent era for Sweden than the later Viking Age. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, let's get into it. I'll be reading from the Saga Fragments. And um, uh, usually they're translated in a kind of a present tense, as the Norris switches between a past and present tense. I'm doing it, everything in past tense, like, uh, traditionally told, because it looks... I think it re reads really awkward when you translate it like that. It works well in Norris. And this switch to the presence sometimes it gives a slight dramatic feel, natural feel, but in English it just looks weird. So that's how I choose to do it. And uh, yeah, so let's dive into it. I'm skipping the whole political layout in the beginning. I already sketched that out briefly in the introduction, so I'm going straight to the battle, which is also the most vividly told and all this. It's said that in uh, King Harald's host there was a commander called Brune. This Brune is the same one uh, Saxo gives an alternative version of, where he dies on a mission and uh, Odin takes his appearance and sows a division between Sigurding and King Harald Wartooth. Here he's still a commander with uh, King Harald Wartooth, the Danish king. He was the wisest of the, all those who were with him. King Harald and uh, Brune drew up the ranks and organized the commanders under their standards. King Harald's banner stood in the middle of the battle line and around his standard were his personal retainers. These champions were with King Harald, Svein, Sam, Gnepe, the old, Garid, Brand, Bleng, Tait, Tyrfing, and uh, Yalte. They were King Harald's skulls and champions. On the expedition from King Harald's retinue were Jort, Borgar, Bele, Barre, Baigor, and Toke. Present there were the shield maidens Visma and Heid, and they come with a great host to King Harald. Visma bore his standard. With her were these champions, Kore and Milva, and there was another shield maiden called Vebjörg, who'd come to King Harald with a great host from Gotland, along with many champions. Greatest and most famous of them all were Ubbe, the Frisian, Brat of Ireland, Orm of England, Bue, the son of Brahma, and one-eyed Are and Geiralf. Gotland here, like Gotland uh, and uh, Raid Gotland, Raid Gotland can mean different things. Usually they encompass, uh, Raid Gotland uh, can be Jutland, especially, but also Denmark, and uh, but going south from uh, uh, Denmark into the traditional Gothic lands, they're also called Raid Gotland. So in ancient times, Denmark was uh, and uh, South Sweden were seen as a part of the Gothic nations and of course the Gothic nations themselves said they originated from there and uh, Gotland the island outside out of Sweden Swedish island is still called Gotland in the Baltic Sea so when she comes from Gotland here, it's not from Gotland the island, I think. I think since all the champions she's coming with are from uh, further south in Europe and uh, the British Isles, I would say it's fairly likely she's a champion not from Norse areas, but from Saxon or further down in Europe. Mm. 
The shield maiden Visma, and this Geirolf here, Geir means spear, isn't the same as uh, Olaf Geirstadolf, he lived at a much later point in time. So this is a uh, Geirolf, I would say probably from uh, some uh, Gothic kingdoms further south. The shield maiden uh, Visma was accompanied by a great host of uh, Wends. So Visma is also Wendland is usually and in this case it is the northern Polish areas. North Denmark is also called Wendsyssel but uh, in this case it is, it's specified actually in uh, uh, Gesta Danorum by Saxo. She comes with 7,000 soldiers from the uh, Polish areas and uh, it, it can be confusing in Saxo it says it takes um, King Harald seven days to sail to uh, southern Sweden where the battle is held but when you see the way he's sailing it makes sense because from Shellon to Sweden it's only a few hours sailing over the sound but if you in in uh, he first gathers his host in Shellon and in Saxo he uh, meets up with Visma and the Wendish host later so then he's uh, at the uh, nor uh, southern coast of the Baltic Ocean, probably maybe also traveling in river down the Vistula or something like that, and gathering uh, armies there. And then it takes some days to sail back to the west coast of South Sweden. So then it makes sense. Anyway, Visma is not a Norse warrior either. She's from uh, northern Germany or northern Poland. These so uh, the shield maiden Visma was accompanied by a great host of Wends. They were easy to recognize. They had long swords and bucklers rather than the long shields such as other men wore. Other men bore. And in the other wing of King Harald's host was the shield maiden Hyde with her standard. And she had with her a hundred champions. Her berserks were called Grim, Geir, Holmstein, Isodul, Hedin the Slim, Dag of Livlon and Harald Olafsson. Again, uh, um, champions from uh, Baltic, probably Baltic and European areas. There were many commanders in that wing with Hyde, and that wing was a commander called Ho uh, Hawk, yeah? cut cheek, and the standard was born before him. There were many kings and champions with him. Present there were Alfar and Alfarin, the sons of King Gandalf who previously had been courtiers and retainers to King Harald. And, uh, these names are typically royal names out of uh, Alfheim, also called Ranarike, west of West Gautland. So uh, the kingdom in what is today further, so further southeast in Norway and a good chunk of uh, southwest Sweden just north of uh, Jötalan, northwest of Jötalan. Still the, the valleys inland from the, the coast there going north are called Alvdal. And uh, going from Alvdal, including the coastal areas, was uh, in previous times was Alfheim. King Harald was in a wane, for he wasn't capable of bearing arms. So he couldn't go into battle. The king sent Brune and Hyde to see how Ring had dis has disposed his forces and whether he was ready for battle. Brune said, It seems to me that Ring and his host are most likely ready to fight. He has uh, disposed his forces strangely. He's drawn them up in a wedge formation and it won't be good to fight with him. So the... Often the chosen offensive battle formation of the... Norris was a, this was Svine Fylking, it was called in Norris. Then King Harald said, Who can have taught the ring the wedge formation? I thought no one knew it but me and Odin. Has Odin's generosity with victories finally failed me? That has never been the case yet, and again I beseech him not to let it be so now. But if he doesn't wish to grant me victory, then let him cause me to fall in battle with all my host, if he doesn't wish the Danes to triumph as before. And all the dead who fall on this field, I give to Odin. It was as Brune said, 
that Ring had drawn up his whole army into a wedge formation. The ranks then seemed all the deeper for the wedge projecting like a snout at the front. But one wing reached as far as the river Var and the other down to Brovik. King Ring had brought to the battle with him many kings and champions. Foremost among them was King Ola the Bold, who had a great host of warriors, including many other renowned kings and champions. And he was a king out of uh, Upland in uh, the Uplands of Norway, so eastern Norway. With him was that most famed of all the champions in Tales of Yore, Starkard the Old Sturvekson. Uh, Starkard the Old is uh, Starkad the Old is really one of the most famous uh, warriors and champions in uh, Norse uh, history and uh, he figures in prominently many sagas, quads and uh, there's a lot on him in Gesta Danorum and other sagas so Starkad he was uh, uh, very famous he had been raised in Hordalan in Norway on the Isle of Fenring. I'm not sure the, the only place around in Hordalan which has these place names is uh, close to what is today called Kleppeste, which could make sense. It's outside of Bergen, uh, but uh, I'm absolutely not sure. And uh, had traveled wide, widely and served many kings. Many other champions had come from Norway to this battle. Trand of Trøndelag, Torer of Møre, Helge the White, Bjarne, Hav, Finn of Firda, Sigur, Erling Snake of Jaren, Saga Erik, Holmstein the White, Einar of Agder, Rutt the Wavering, Odd the Traveler, Einar Snowshoe, and Ivar Holme or Hedla. These were the great champions of King Ring. Åge, Eivind, Egil Squinter, Hildir, Gaute, Gude Tollus, Stein of Venern, and Styr the Strong. These formed yet another company, Rane Hildarsson, Svein the Slicer, Leimbode, and Sota of Song. Sota of Song is often tra translated as um, Sokken Sota, but uh, and it, uh, uh, Sokken Sot is his name, and it's often translated as um, uh, um, uh, Assault Sot, which it could be it, uh, translated as that. But Sot is also a normal uh, king's name in uh, on the west part of Norway, Hordaland and Rogaland, um, and Song. And, um, uh, so he's it's it's uh, or a normal name among earls and kings and noblemen there. So I think actually it should it's it's more likely that it's just not a salt sota but sota from a song. Rockel Crutch and Rolf the ladies man. Then there were Dog the giant, again Dog the Dog Digre. In Digre is often translated as uh, Dog the Fat, and it's just not the correct translation of Digir. St. Olaf was also called Olav and Digre, and uh, it, nobody in his right mind in that time would call him Fat. So Digir, even if you use it today in Norway, he's Digir. It means he's, well, he can be fat, but it mostly means he's giant, he's powerful, big man. Uh, you know, powerful, strong it means. It's not fat. So, Dag the Giant, Gerd the Happy, Duk the Vend, Glum of Värmland, from the west side of the river Gauta, uh, Göta, Göta, Saxe Flette, and Sale the Gaut. These came down from Sviavelde, Nore, Hake, Karl the Lump, Kroker of Aker, Gunfast, and Glismak the Good. These came down from uh, Sigtuna, so around the uh, modern day Uppsala. Sigmund, the Kaupang champion, Tole Froste, Adils, the rash of Uppsala. He went out in front of the standard and the shields and wasn't in the ranks. So Adils, the rash, would fight in front of the army alone. And Sigval, uh, <coughs> Sigval who brought 11 ships to King Ring. Tryggven Tvivil had brought 12 ships. 
Lasser had a warship full of champions. Eirik Helsing had a large dragon ship well manned with warriors. There were also men who'd come to King Ring from Telemark, who were champions and who had the least favor because they were considered drawlers and slow speakers. And <laughs> even today, uh, Telemark, its inland source, South Norway, is still considered to have the most awkward dialect of them all, hardest to understand, and a lot of the yeah, so, so it's funny reading this as Norwegian because it's kind of the stereotype of the Telemarking if you're not from Telemark today. Uh, so. But they vindicate themselves later in the battle. And these came from uh, Telemark. Torkel, the stubborn. Torleif, the goth. Hot, the hard. Grettir, the crooked. And Roald, toe. And here Torleif, the goth. Again, saying go, uh, what is a goth isn't necessarily the uh, very reductive understanding often today. And there are many place names along the coast of South Norway, just north of uh, Telemark, that are called um, uh, something with gout. And uh, the main mountain in Telemark is called Gaustatoppen. So the top of the Goths, <coughs> mountain of the Goths. Um, also with King Ring was a man called Rongval. Uh, Gaut is an old word for uh, Goth in uh, the north. Also with King Ring was a man called Rongval the Tall or uh, Rongval Fist, the finest of champions. He was the first, uh, furthest forward in front of the wedge. And next to him were Trygve and Lasir, and on the outside, Yngve and the sons of Alrek. Then there were the men of Telemark, who everyone least wanted to have, and they thought there'd be little help to be had from them. They were great bowmen. So this is the layout of the battle, and you can see there, according to the saga, it's basically all of uh, Norway, Denmark, and Sweden. All the nobles have brought their best men, in addition, all the bordering nations to the south have brought auxiliary forces and champions. And according to the sagas, many of these were um, paying geld money to uh, uh, King Harald uh, Wartooth. And this is also what I think uh, when people, uh, when, when, you, when you look at King Ivar Widefathom, uh, and it says that he, uh, had, a, he had a kingdom Com comprising like massive swaths of northern Europe and uh, Northumbria and England and uh, you can't find it in the genealogy of of um, uh, in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle believe me I've looked <laughs> but um, um, if you look in the sagas many times the Danish kings Consider the people conquered if they're paying uh, them uh, like protection money, tax. If, they're paying, if you're paying the Danish king tax money, he considers you your servant. So if the Danish king, which at that early time, in the early times of Ivar Widefathom and even earlier, they were Jutish and Danish kings. They were very intimately related through their uh, lineages with the uh, Anglo-Saxon kings. So if at a certain time an Anglo-Saxon king was owed something or had lost battle or had been forced by a show of force to pay tax, then uh, uh, he would be considered a subordinate. Um, so perhaps this is what is at play many times when they claim these large empires. In a way, the, the claim is fair enough. We are under a given government today when we pay tax. <coughs> when all of this army was ready for battle, trumpets were blown on each side and they roared out their battle cries with all the strength they had. And the two armies closed for battle. And that fight was of such ferocity and magnitude 
that it is said in all the old sagas there hasn't been a battle fought in the, all the Northlands with so many men or so fine a selection of warriors. And when the battle had been going on for a while, the champion in King Harald's army, who was called Ubbe the Frisian, advanced to attack the tip of the wedge in King Ring's line. And he fought the first combat with Rongval Radbar. Another name, which is um, pointing to uh, more southern European kingdoms and uh, uh, Baltic areas, southern Baltic areas. And there was a ferocious encounter and fearsome blows could be seen traded there in the host when these dauntless heroes clashed. Each dealt the other many heavy blows, but Ubbe was such a great champion that he didn't let up till their duel was over with Rongval having fallen at his hand. And thereupon he rushed at Trygve and dealt him a deadly wound, and when the sons of Alrek saw how fero ferociously he fared through the host, they went up against him and fought with him. But he was such a hardy and great champion that he slew them both. And then he slew Yngve. And then he went charging so furiously through the host that nothing could withstand him. And he struck down all who stood in the wedge, except for those who gave way and backed up towards the other champions. When King Ring saw this, he urged his army not to let one man overcome them all such lordly men as were with him. And where is the champion Starkad, who till now has never suffered defeat? Win us victory. <clears throat> he answered, We have our work cut out for us. He said, But we'll try to win such a victory as we can. But that man Ubbe is someone who could test a man to his full. But at the urging of the king, he charged forward through the host at Ubbe, and there took place a mighty battle between them, with heavy blows and great strength, as both were dauntless heroes. And so it went on for a while, and Starkald, and Starkad dealt him a terrible wound, and in return Starkad received six wounds, all grave, and he didn't think he'd ever been so hard pressed by one man. And because the opposing lines were each so strong, they were tossed about, now one way and now the other, and were separated in the crush, and so their fight was broken up. Then Ubbe slew the champion called Angnar. He hewed to either side of him, constantly clearing a path for himself, and both his arms were bloody to the shoulders. And then he attacked the men of Telemark. And when they saw him, they said, we needn't look for a target anywhere else in the army now. Instead, let us direct our armies at this man for a time. And as little expectation as everyone has of us, let's make so much the mark of ourselves now and show ourselves to be valiant men. The finest of the Telemarkers began to shoot at him. Had the hard and Rual to and they were such fine archers that they shot at him two dozen arrows that pierced his breast. And he didn't roll over without a fight. These men dealt death to him, and before that he'd slain six champions and dealt grave wounds to eleven more, and slain sixteen of Swedish and Gautish men who stood in front, who stood in the front rank. At that time the shield maiden Vebjörg attacked the Swedes and Gauts hard. She advanced on that champion called Sokinsulta, and she'd so accustomed herself to helm and brynje and sword that she was the foremost in the knightly arts, as Starkad the Old says. She dealt heavy blows to the champion and didn't let up her attack for a long time. And with one blow, she slashed through his cheek and cut through the jaw and sliced off his chin. He thrust his beard into his mouth and bit on that and so held on to his chin. And she performed many great feats in the host. A little later she encountered King Ring's champion, Torkil the Stubborn, and they fought a hard battle. And by the time it was over he'd slain her with many wounds and great gallantry. So another one of the Telemarkers who's showing his worth. 
Now there came to pass much of note in a short space of time, and each side had the upper hand by turns. Many a man was never to re return home from that field, and many were maimed on either side. Now Starkad attacked the Danes. He advanced on a champion called Hun, and they fought a battle, and in the end Starkad slew him. And shortly thereafter, the man who sought to avenge him, whose name was Ella. Hun in Old Norse means hunter. And then he attacked Borgar, and theirs was a hard-fought encounter, and it ended with Borgar's death. Starkad charged on now through the ranks with his sword drawn and hewed them down one after another. And next he struck down the one called Jort, and then he met the shield maiden Visma, who bore King Harald's standard. Starkad attacked her fiercely. She then said to Starkad, Now the greed of the grave has come for you, and now you are going to die, troll. He answered, First you'll lower King Harald's standard, and he hacked off her left hand. She calls him Troll. It's also because there are stories in the sagas where uh, Starkad isn't raised in Halland, but in among the Jotuns, the son of a Jotun, and he had uh, eight arms, this and all this to, to explain why he was such a formidable warrior. Here he's just a mortal champion. So he answered, first you'll, first you'll lower the King Harald's standard, and he hacked off her left hand. And then a man called Brahe came at him to avenge her. He was Seigalv's father. And Starkad ran through him with his sword. And all through the host there could now be seen great heaps of the slain. A little later there came, a man, there came against Starkad a great champion by the name of Gnepja. And they fought hard and Starkad dealt him his death wound. Thereupon he killed the champion Hake and received then many grave wounds in that exchange. He was cut between his neck and shoulder, so deep his insides could be seen, and he had a wound on the front of his chest so great that his lungs were falling out, and he lost one finger on his right hand. And when King Harald saw such great loss of life among his retinue and champions, he raised himself up onto his knees and took two short swords and lashed on with a will the horse that pulled his wain and was thrusting to either side of him with his short swords and dealt death to many a man, though he couldn't walk or sit on a horse. The battle went on now for a while, while the king accomplished many great deeds. And towards the end of this battle, King Harald Wartooth was struck on the head with a club so that his skull was cracked apart, and that wound was the death of him, and Brune was his killer. And here we see perhaps the explanation of Saxo's alternate version. So Brune, who was Harald's man, kills him here, just as he in the alternate version is the source of the conflict by betrayal. So I'm not going to say whichever is right, but it's uh, interesting, this connection. And then King Ring saw King Harald's wain empty and guessed that the king must be fallen. He had the trumpets blown and called on his army to cease fighting. And when the Danes came, came, became aware of this, the battle came to a halt, and King Ring offered truce to all of King Harald's army, and they all accepted it. And on the morning of the following day, King Ring had the dead searched for the body of his king's men. And on the morning of the following day, King Ring had the dead searched for the body of his kinsman, King Harald and a great host of slain men lay over the place where his body lay. It was midday when the body was found and the dead cleared. And then King Ring had the body of his king's kinsman King Harald taken and the blood washed off and had it prepared with every honor after the old custom. He had the body laid in the wain that King Harald had used for the battle. And after that, he had a great mound raised and had King Harald's body driven into the mound in the same wain, drawn with the same horse that he had in the battle. And then the horse was killed. And then King Ring had the saddle fetched that he himself had ridden on, and offered it to his kinsman King Harald, and bade him do whichever he wished, ride to Valhall 
on horseback or in his wain. And then he had a great feast prepared to see off his kinsman, King Harald. And before the mound was sealed, King Ring bid all the nobles and all the champions who were stood there to cast into the grave big arm rings and good weapons in honor of King Harald Wartooth. And after that, the mound was closed with all due care. What a battle and what a description. This is uh, as a piece of literature, in my opinion, this is kind of like uh, Horn Clovis poetry. It's very direct and very colorful. And after a uh, the reason I made this video is I was reading the Frankish Annals, which can be really, really boring. And uh, and then I uh, revisited this, and it was such a so refreshing to read. I wanted to do this video because it's it's also <clears throat> like in Heimskringla, for example. Uh, it um, oftentimes uh, battles are more expressed to poems and quite short Snorri is quite short in relaying but the style of this is more lively more colorful more like the local Iceland Icelander sagas and also uh, the color and tone of King Sverre's Sverre Sigurdsson's saga the later king in Norway so uh, I, I just thought I'd share share this it's uh, for people who aren't so no, uh, uh, n n familiar with the saga literature, it's also not pr probably not so present. This saga fragment, and it's such a colorful piece of uh, storytelling. Personally, I also think this battle, in some form, happened. If it was where it was precisely and how large and such, uh, uh, I'm not going to say. But uh, taking in cons to consideration the, like the historical landscape at the time, I think it's, it's not beyond the pale at all. So that's that for this time. I hope you enjoyed it and I uh, hope you join me for another video another time. And if you enjoy the content, please subscribe and leave any comments if you have suggestions or criticism or anything.